ladies and gentlemen. An opportunity like this cannot be taken for granted. This evening, we are going to be beating our hearts out for you all, so I want to see people enjoying themselves. So get up and feel the music and do something about it, okay? This event is a right of cultural democracy. We have many, many partners, you included. I encourage you to stand alongside with us as we travel this journey year after year. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are missing a speaker. Uh, hopefully she will turn up soon, but uh, let's get this party started. So my name is Lisa Borlechka. I've been working in the cultural and creative industries in the UAE for the last 16 years. Doesn't it show? Um, and today we are going to be talking about craft. In fact, the future of craft. We're going to hear some from two wonderful um, artists and arts professionals and craftspeople um, who are working in the United Arab Emirates um, on on fantastic work, I have to say. So joining us today is, um, on my far right, Farshid Jabakal. Farshid is the director of the, well, one of the directors, I should say, of the Fatima bin Mohammed Initiative, a social enterprise that is based in Dubai that supports artisans and farmers in Afghanistan by bringing products to the market and investing in Afghan communities to improve access to health and education. Uh, next to him is Sara al Hassani. Sara is the owner of Khazaf for Fine Art, a ceramic studio in Abu Dhabi. Um, she's got a wonderful stand over in the, uh, in the United Arab Emirates area, so please go and make some ceramics with her. She's also part of the Lest We Forget initiative, which is an archival and research initiative that documents Im Emirati vernacular memory. Um, hopefully later we'll be joined by Azza al um, a, uh, a leader uh, in the art sector in the UAE. She is both a jeweler and a sculptor. So let's talk about craft. Um, Sarah, let's talk about your practice. Introduce us to your practice and, and why you fell in love with it in the first place. Okay, so I have a, uh, I have a studio in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. Uh, we teach uh, ceramics uh, from wheel throwing, hand building, and glazing. And uh, I opened the studio last year, uh, October, but I've been um, into ceramics for eight years now. Uh, I had my studio in the house, and uh, after that, I uh, decided to teach. So, yeah. And um, tell us a little bit about your, your daily routine. Tell us about the materials that you use, your process. Okay, so the materials we use is in the studio is uh, stoneware uh, clay. Uh, we also use um, high fire, low fire clay and high fire, low fire glazes. And uh, we source it all from the US, by the way. Uh, even when I came here to the festival, they were asking me, do you want to get the clay and glazes with you? I'm like, no, because I source it from there. <laughs> because the, the brand I use is Amaco and it's from here and uh, the supplier gets it to the UAE. But then I try my best to uh, create different uh, items that go with our culture as well. So, so let's, just a simple question, why not use clay from the UAE? Because? Uh, the clay in the UAE is different than the clay we fire in automatic kilns. And I never used it, to be honest. I don't know what the type of temperature if we're using the automatic kilns for it. Yeah, sure. So, and it's a different type of clay, that's why. But it's interesting how you're bringing together in every piece uh, the US and the UAE together yes. in terms of material and process and design. Yes, I tried different materials from the UK, from uh, different countries, US as well. But uh, because the, uh, we don't have much suppliers in the UAE for those materials, so the most ones are coming from here. Okay, fantastic. So from clay to carpets, Farshid, tell us a le little bit about FBMI and the Zuleha brand. Yes, uh, good afternoon everyone. So. 
in brief, FBMI stands for Fatima bin Mohammed bin Zayed Initiative, which is the president of the UAE's daughter. And the initiative started in 2010 when she wanted to make a change in the lives of Afghans and provide them with an opportunity to work in the handmade carpet industry. Uh, the reason why she chose handmade carpets was our survey saw that the women possess the skills in making carpets. It's a craft. It's, it's part of their heritage and a craft that's been passed down through generations. And one other important thing was that they were able to work from homes in, on these carpets. So we distribute the looms out to the homes all around Afghanistan. Our access, our reach was much further. Um, and we'd be able to employ these women and provide them an opportunity to actually work on carpets and, and ensure there's a market they could sell it to. Um, speaking of market, the latter part, Zulia is the brand. Lisa mentioned Zulia, so our concept is basic in Afghanistan. We work on the ground to uh, provide jobs, healthcare, education, any humanitarian work and social projects. And the products they make, so we provide them employment, no handouts or charity. The products they make, one of which is carpets, is then sold through a retail brand called Zulia. So it operates as a business, self-sustainable business, ensuring they are sort of, you know, you know it's self-sustainable, the business goes on, it, it's shifted, it's, you know, it's affected by supply and demand, and, and they, they will always, you know, the profits are reinvested back into keeping them employed and increasing employment and, and social services for them. So in brief, that's what FBMI and Zulia is. So how did you, going back to you, Sara, how did you learn your craft? Um, how did you, you master clay? Uh, to be honest, I loved art from a young age. My, uh, my mom is a painter, and I grew up loving arts and crafts for so many years. And then I uh, studied multimedia design in uh, Zayed University, and, and part of that was in the art college. But after graduation, I wanted to explore different mediums uh, in different arts, um, uh, workshops and courses, so I fell in love with clay. And then I continued. Because in the UAE, as I understand it, there are two institutions that offer degrees in fine art. Yes. Um, there's Zayed University, one of the yes. federal institutions, and then there is the University of Sharjah yes. in one of the Emirates, the Emirate next door to Dubai, if you know your UAE geography. Um, uh, but beyond university, how did you make that move from a student loving clay to a craftsperson running, set, running your own studio? Uh, so um, I always tell people that if you want to start a business and you want it to, to keep growing, you have to have the passion for it. And because I have the passion for clay and, and crafts in general, uh, I started uh, small first uh, in my house. I kept uh, practicing with, with clay and then I go take courses with experts so whenever there is someone visiting the UAE from outside or inside the UAE who gives workshops, I will always take the workshop and courses with them. And then the most time that I actually learned this craft was when COVID started, because I started to do everything from scratch in, in my house, in my studio. And this is when I realized that uh, some of the shops started closing and there are no uh, kilns that we can rent or uh, places to go get materials. I, want, I wanted to get ev everything in the house. And I, I bought the kiln, I bought an, uh, I, I got a better uh, wheel for the wheel throwing. And here when I started to recycle the clay myself, wedge the clay and the whole process. And then after that, I started posting on Instagram. And this is where people started to know me. And uh, so many people wanted uh, some um, uh, production work for coffee shops and restaurants and flower shops. So I started to do everything all by, my, uh, by myself in the house. Uh, and then I, I think uh, people started to ask me, do you teach ceramics or no? And um, I started to rent places like, uh, to give uh, workshops in different centers. And after two years of COVID, I was like, no, I have to get my own studio, you know, it's, it's because I'm renting the place there with them and I'm giving the ceramic uh, workshop, so I might as well uh, open my own studio. Every cloud has a silver lining <laughs> at the end of the day. Uh -huh. I think your story resonates with so many other artists that I've met, both in the UAE and elsewhere, that, you know, they have em they embraced the lockdown, they embraced the isola isolation and it gave them an opportunity to double down and mm -hmm. really root their practice and root their business um, firmly in order to grow. 
Actually, so many people was asking me, so in the lockdown, were you really bored? I was like, no, I was so busy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Farshid, um, yeah. you know, Sarah's talked about sort of institutional learning, how she, she really sort of developed her core skills at university. Um, but the Fatma bin Mohammed initiative, that's a very much familial, traditional learning, is it not? How do the women teach each other? teach the next generation? Yeah, so I mean, I'm going to speak on behalf of, of craftspeople that we work with. Um, but what we've seen with Afghanistan, carpet making is, is not just limited to Afghanistan. Of course, it starts from sort of North Africa. It's a tradition and part of the heritage up into South and, and, and Central Asia, um, even up to China. So, but what we, I think, preserving that craft it's, we've seen digitization of this craft. So, so in, in sort of areas, countries more like China, they're from handmade carpets, they're shifting more to machine-made carpets. It's cheaper. Why would you pay so much for it? Why, why, why can't you, if you can make it in a week, why would you wait four or five months for it? But it's important, I think, to, to preserve that craft and, and, and preserve that art of handmade to not take away the livelihoods of the people, so the opportunity for them to, to, to work. And unfortunately, in these kind of countries, and what we've seen with our weavers, um, is that these, it's a way for them to connect and, and use their crafts. It's a way for them, end of the day, to have a source of income, these carpets. What we have here today as well, one of our weavers, in addition to a source of income, it's their way of connecting with their culture, connecting back. So if you, you see our space here, it's a weaver that has settled in the US six months ago. He's from Afghanistan. He moved there with his daughters. They're both carpet weavers. Um, like I said, carpets is the largest export of Afghanistan. Most of it actually comes to the US. Um, and, and this person here, he doesn't speak English. He has a language barrier. So his only, he communicates back or he connects back with his culture, him and his daughter, when they work on a loom together on the same carpet. Um, his, his wife is left behind in Afghanistan. So this is their way of connecting back. So I think it's important to preserve this craft, knowing uh, I speak on behalf of, of craft people in Afghanistan, but I think it's similar in that region. And similarly, we see here, we have some craft people from the UAE. Um, and walking through, you'd actually see that there are, you'd understand there's a, there's a difference in sort of backgrounds and mentalities from these craftspeople and even just through the UAE exhibition you'd see people coming from different emirates different regions of the country all with a different let's say a way of life not not similar but but still yet different um so it's important to understand and try to preserve and let them be in their environment and and you know while while trying to showcase that on a level like we have over here and it's fantastic what we've got over yeah. here i've got to see it's a real microcosm of the traditional crafts that form the identity of the United Arab Emirates mm -hmm. and its people. Um, and, and let's just, you know, emphasize that whilst there are borders now that divide, separate UAE from Saudi and from Oman, these crafts permeate across the whole of the Arabian Gulf. So over there, you will be able to see telly, uh, which is beautiful embroidery uh, using gold thread. You'll be able to see sadu, uh, the, the native weaving of the whole of the Gulf from Kuwait uh, to the UAE. Um, you'll also see khus weaving, the weaving of um, safifa, of uh, palm fronds and palm leaves as well. There is a very entrepreneurial lady, Um Saeed, uh, I'm sure you've seen her with her baskets and her mats. Everybody is raving about them over the last couple of days. Um, and clay, going back to clay, it is a traditional crafts material of the UAE. There are many um, uh, traditional potteries in the UAE and also in the neighboring countries, in Al Ali, in Bahrain, for example, in Oman. Um, do you feel connected to that tradition? Yes, a lot. Uh, actually, I always back. Uh, I always go back to the uh, traditional items that we use in the house as well, like from those craftsmen. Such as? Such as the incense burners, or uh, there is something uh, just like a vase that my grandma used to put water inside, and it will cool down the water. Uh, the amphora. We call them amphoras. Uh, the big, yes, big yes, amphoras, yes. yeah. From re we remember them from the Romans. Oh yes, okay, uh, that's nice. <laughs> and so, so our cultures connect. Yeah. So I grew up seeing my grandma use use that a lot, until we we're like, uh, even when like after I grew up a little, it was still there, and I was so like after that, uh, after I started to know the craft, I started to remember how it looks like and how the shape and if I can re uh, redo that yes. shape again. 
yeah, and reinterpreting. Exactly. That's, that's the challenge. Um, earlier today, we had um, the almost the laureate calligrapher of the UAE, Mohammed Al Mandi, uh, talking about his 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 journey as a calligrapher, um, and and it. The same story uh, reflects in other crafts practices. Um, for centuries, uh, calligraphy and other crafts practices have been protected and preserved by the practitioners who follow the rules, who follow the technique to the nth degree. Um, but now we are at an age where people are hungry to experiment. They're curious to break those boundaries of convention, liberate these crafts from their gilded cages and almost rebel against the purists to find their own form of self-expression, whether it is in clay, whether it is in weaving and so forth. So um, tell us a little bit about how you have rifted on, on the traditional vernacular and how you have uh, contemporized uh, those items that you've inherited from your from your from your practice or your forefathers. Okay, so most of the items actually that I cre uh, create in my studio are some functional items that we still use in the house traditionally. So just like the incense burners or the coffee cups, the Arabic coffee cups, but in a modern contemporary way and so minimal designs, because people now they love to uh, include that in their house and use it still but they want something that goes well with their interior, the modern interior of the houses. So that's been very popular. And what about you, Farshid, um, in, terms of, in terms of contemporizing uh, the designs that, um, you know, that you sell through yeah. FBMI? Yeah, I think it's one of our key sort of components or pillars is sustainability. And, and in order to be sustainable, you have to make sure that you're producing a product that, is, that appeals to people or any ordinary person that would want to buy it off the shelves. So an issue we've had with Afghan carpets is it's difficult to compete with other countries. For example, Iran's the leader in handmade carpets. Um, it's difficult to compete if your product isn't different or if your product doesn't offer something. So we work a lot on, I think, product development and ensuring at the same time, some people make the mistake of trying to preserve their craft, but preserve it in a way where it looks the same as 100 years ago or what they were taught. But that's, I think you have to keep up with the times and take your craft, stick up to the craft, the actual skill, and develop it and, and take it further into something that, that you know, keeps up with today's um, demand and today's sort of market demand in that sense. So I think it's really important to, to make a product that, is, that will appeal to anyone and in, in, it has that commercial aspect. Because if it, if it doesn't, I think you just, there's, yeah, you reach the end of the road at some point. Um, in, in the organization that I, I work at, uh, Tashkil, which is based in Dubai, we run a uh, one-year professional development program. And so every year we have around 70 or 80 emerging designers apply and we pick about four. So it's very competitive. And what we task them with is we give them some training, um, but we basically task them with the job of creating and prototyping a piece of furniture or lighting that is inspired by the UAE, des uh, designed in the UAE, and most importantly, manufactured in the UAE. And over the following six months, they have to prototype and then produce the first edition, which we reveal every year at Dubai Design Week, which is a big design festival in Dubai, which is the only UNESCO city of design in the Middle East. What we find difficult is consumer attitude to made in UAE products. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, you, it's made in, yeah. your, your products are made in Anga Afghanistan, mm -hmm. your products are made in the UAE. So I want to ask you, Sarah, uh, I'm going to vent my frustration here. Um, people, do people value made in UAE? Yes, a lot. Uh, first, I uh, created the stamp that I use under all the pieces I create, which is written made in UAE, because I think that makes it so special and makes people understand that it's, it's actually made in the UAE. And then when people approach me, like for people who, are, who own businesses, for example, like coffee shops or restaurants, they, when they approach me, they say, you know, we've been uh, supplying our um, plates and cups from outside the UAE, but we didn't know we, you, we have something like this here. So from now on, we'll just, we'll just do it with you. So they really appreciate, they really start, they started to understand it more. And even uh, my studio being there 
I think they understand the process now of how to make ceramics and what is the stages that it goes through. So craft, craft has a future if it can uh, captivate commerce. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Made in Afghanistan, yeah. does, does that carry the, the cachet that it, takes you forward? I think it's, it was more challenging with our pilot project being in Afghanistan. Um, but like I mentioned over there at the other stage, uh, we served, it's important to serve as a platform where these, these products you make, where they can reach and what recognition they get. So we take part in design fairs. We, we collaborate with international designers. Um, these carpets made by these women have reached the likes of Pope Francis, Barack Obama, and, and gone to embassies worldwide. So that sort of level, once they get the recognition, I believe and if, that we've managed to do with Afghanistan. Um, as our pilot project now, we're looking at the UAE. So what we would want to do, we've been tasked to do is look at creating a platform where we can get artists together, um, which, which would be labeled made in the UAE, basically, and develop products, bring together a collection of products, and, and where they get recognition, the reach, they have the support to reach there, and also they can make products which would, you know, people would actually want to buy it, not just for made in UAE, they shouldn't buy it for that product, for that reason, or for a cause of giving back, it should be secondary. Um, it's just simple consumer behavior, I think. If it looks good, you want to keep it in your house, the story or where the money goes sometimes to, unfortunately, to a lot of people isn't the primary reason to buy. But, but it's a contributing factor, yeah. isn't it? You've got the, the story, the narrative behind the piece, the quality of the piece, and then where the piece is made and how the piece yeah. has been made, that's very important as well. And educating the consumer. So informing them of what they're buying and where it goes, how ethical it is. Or with Sarah, for example, the effort that goes into making that, the way, the time she spends at home sitting and making that. Unfortunately, like I said, with digitization and these machines coming in, we still have to, we have to keep that, we have to support the, and preserve the, the, the manual method for, for, for yeah. now, I think, yeah. Um, Sarah, I want to ask you with your other hat on, so uh, not your independent fine art studio, but looking at your role in Lest We Forget, which is an, is an initiative by um, uh, the Sheikh Salama Foundation in Abu Dhabi. Um, the Lest We Forget is a, a guardian of memories. Um, it's, uh, it's initiated a movement over the last eight years or so mm -hmm. um, to really encourage, particularly the Emirati, as well as the expatriate community, to um, archive their memories, archive both intangible and tangible um, possessions and artifacts and, and knowledge. Do you think that all the crafts that your forefathers, your grandmothers practice, do you think that they are evolving, maturing, continuing to grow in the 21st century? Or, or what more needs to be done? Uh, I think yes, because so many people, like young people, are very interested into those crafts, and they're still keeping it alive. But they're also changing it into more modern and contemporary way, but the function is still the same. So, for example, if someone is born in a family where they have a, a specific crafts, they will learn it from their grandfather or grandmother, and they will keep it going, which is very nice. Uh, we, we are very proud of our culture and traditions, and we always want to keep it alive. And we are passing it to our new gen generation as well. Let us take the audience now, 12,000 kilometers, over to the other side of the world, to Liwa, to my favorite festival, the Al Dhafra Mazayin Camel Festival. Yes, ladies, there's a camel festival in Abu Dhabi, and it's fantastic. Um, every time I go there, there is a cultural village, and there are lazy, ladies like Um Saeed over there selling her Safifa goods that have, are running their own micro enterprises from their kitchens um, in the empty quarter. Um, talk us through, for the audience, talk us through the, the different sort of tangible pieces of heritage that we can see from being sold by these craftswomen, like the bakhoor, the honey, mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there are people, uh, so, uh, some women uh, create, for example, henna, which I have on my hands now, which uh, they take from uh, their own garden, and uh, they take the leaves of the henna plant, and they uh, uh, turn it into powder. Uh, first they dry it, and then turn it into powder, and, they, uh, and then paste, and use it on the hands. There are other people who create bakhoor, which is the incense. And this is also something that they pass uh, in, into this, the different generations in one family. Also, there is uh, people who um, have the craft of uh, kahil, which is the eyeliner, the black one. 
and uh, they actually teach uh, other uh, members of their family to keep this craft alive. Uh, what else? Uh, Yes, that's what I remember. Yes, no. the, the, the Bukhur and the Henna yes, are, yes. are staples. Um, we talk about a lot about women. Sorry, Farshin. <laughs> uh, we're talking a lot about women, how women are the guardians of, of, of many crafts in the UAE. Um, is that true? And where do the men fit in? Okay, so if we, we, we go back to my grandparents, my grandma used to uh, be, ve her role is very important in the house because my grandfather used to sail. He was a captain of a ship, so he sails for months just to, for trade. Yeah. And, and this, I think this is where the women part uh, became very important in our uh, country. Until now, to be honest. Like yeah. the women uh, part is so, the women role is very important. And even myself, when I go back home, I will always ask if my mom is around or no. So you can see that she is, she has, she has her hands on so many things in the family and outside of the ma family. She's still working and she is still taking care of her children in the house. Um, like my mom, she's still working in a company, but she goes back to the house to take care of the kids as well. And then she cooks as well. So women in our uh, country has a big role uh, that they put in the, co in the community. And tell us a little bit about how FBMI and yeah. engage women because engage. you've got a, a real yeah. workforce behind Yeah, yeah, you. exactly. We employ over 4,000 um, women across Afghanistan. But I think um, what I'll say is, is on behalf of, of, of the UAE or Afghanistan is the reason why women were probably more active in this is because there's significance or importance or actually there's a reason why behind they are. So for some reasons, they would usually be at home while the male in a patriarchal society would be out as the breadwinner. These women would be working on crafts at home or it has different reason, different meanings to them. In carpet weaving, women have better hands, nibble hands, and they can work better. They actually have a better, they, they are better than men at making carpets. So there's a reason. And the same, I think the balance now that we see, obviously we are working more and we want to see a better balance between men and women. And, and um, of course, I think, what we also have to understand is these they have different meanings so i think making crafts or, or gold or carpets back then had a meaning of maybe in weddings they would exchange it it would mean it would mean having money it would mean being wealthy or it would be a, their way of connecting and it's important for the younger generations the meaning is different to them and i think we have to try to look at how to let, make the younger generations understand these crafts and why preserving it is important because it would mean something else to them rather than you know, these people working on, on crafts back in, in the older days. Um, but yeah, women, I think it's, it's some certain skills, like I said, with carpet making, they, were, they are just better at. And I think it goes back to in time and what was taught down in, in generations, what's passed on to them. Um, but all in all, I think it's a collective process. In carpet making, you have to get the wool, you have to get hand spun wool, you have to gather wool, which, is, which the men go out and do. So I think the collective process is important and ensuring crafts are preserved through a collective process. Let's go back to technology. We, we talked about technology earlier and how it can possibly hinder, but also enhance craft practices. Um, at Tashkil, our, our retail collection that we sell, which is a social enterprise initiative, has um, you know, uh, created um, uh, innovative applications for arish, for palm wood. And we've now developed a composite material from the palm fronds that are seasonally shed in Dubai to create a viable wood for uh, luxury furniture, uh, which we sell uh, with camel cushions, camel leather cushions as well. Um, so we, we are using uh, technology to produce these new composite materials from, from the natural resources of the UAE. Um, does technology play an important role in, in your uh, practice? You, you mentioned the kilns earlier. Certainly, if you left your pieces out in the sun, even in the 50 degree heat of the UAE, it would take <laughs> some time. So tell us about technology in your practice. Actually, everything I use is uh, just a new kind of technology, even the wheel itself. So we do wheel throwing, uh, pottery wheel throwing on the uh, electric wheel, not like the one that they used a long time ago that is a manual that you can like move it with your 
uh, leg. That would be very good keep fit. Yes, Forget I, the peloton, <laughs> Sarah. Yes, yes. And as I mentioned before, the, uh, the kiln, which is an elect electric kiln. And uh, this, is, this is a very easy one. So I don't have to stay overnight just to light it up or to check that. But uh, it, will, it will do everything automatically. And technology, does it play a role yeah. in the traditional weaving practices? I think, yeah, we're talking on behalf of Afghanistan, it's sort of you're taking their livelihood away. If there's a wool spinner whose job can be done by a machine or if there's carpet weaving where you're taking it away and, and, and a machine can do it, you're ultimately taking away their source of income or them having an opportunity to work. Until you, That's why we try to focus a lot on capacity building and giving, teaching them newer skills um, and getting the, for them getting the recognition for what they do. Um, yeah. <laughs> But technology has certainly helped in you reaching more audiences. Exactly. Um, you know, in terms of, you mentioned Instagram earlier. Sometimes I love Instagram, sometimes I can't stand it, but today I love it because it's creating a, sh a consumer portal for you. Similarly, you know, how, what percentage of your products do you sell online? Yeah, yeah, of course, technology helps us in terms of marketing and selling the product. Um, and that's why I circle back to saying the, the young and older generation, rather than men and women, it's more the young and older trying to get that in line. You mentioned the camera festival I don't think a lot of people young young people would want would would see those what you saw in the camel festival so it's 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 the new newer younger generation coming up and trying to appeal and bridge that gap reach them through technology I think if there's something these products should be not just be at the festival but should be on on airlines should be at hotels should be at festivals here should be at places anyone would normally go uh, in the form and, and I think or, or on the phones on social media is a great way um, in that way, technology definitely does help. It's changed. It's changed the whole industry, I think. And do, do you sell? Yes. Uh, so because uh, in my studio, we have a display where we have the products there. But most of the time, we're selling them online because it's so hard for, uh, to, for us to bring everyone to the studio to buy things or to see the materials. But we post it online and we sell it. Also, the booking for the workshops happen online. So they would, uh, they would contact us online and we will book them a session and they will pass by the studio and they will get it. And I think that's where the UAE, it gets exciting in the UAE, when craft and commerce collide. Because, you know, any of you who have looked, you know, seen pictures of Dubai on the internet, what do you see? You see the largest mall in the world, you see hyper-consumerism, you see brand after brand after brand. If you can consign your products to uh, a store in Dubai Mall or Mall of the Emirates or yes. <laughs> any mm -hmm. of them, um, that's when you can start to really reach a good, strong consumer footfall. This is how it started with me, actually. After I started consigning my, my products in flower shops, like vases and things like this to sell, people started to know me more. And now I am allowing other artists to consign their products in my studio. So we will create this community that comes together and shares things together. I love it, love it, love it. Um, we're running out of time and I want to ask if there's any questions from the audience. One more from me. Um, you talked about, both of you talked about earlier, the next generation, the younger people coming through. And, and there is certainly youngsters that are embracing uh, these practices and learning to master them and take them on as the next guardians. But also there is the addiction to the iPad and the screens and you just want to scream when you see their heads down and not looking at the world around them. So what needs to be done to engage more youngsters in craft practices? First, you have, you have to make it interesting for them. I'm a mother of three, so I understand that. <laughs> uh, I know sometimes they, ha they have to get an access to a TV or an iPad because they see others and they will be jealous, you know. But I always keep arts mate art materi materials around the house and they, it's very accessible. If, even if they want to paint the walls, I'm okay about it. At least they are out, like, away from technology. And whenever I go to my studio, I would take them with me sometimes when I'm not too busy. And also, I would encourage any parents who will have their kids, because we have also uh, programs for kids in, in my studio from five or three years, like for glazing or for creating things with their hands. And I always encourage parents to do that. And also, I think family bonding is very important. At Tashkil, we run family workshops so parents and children can create together. Um, do you suffer the same problem of 
people, uh, youngsters being drawn away from their mothers yeah. by the screen or...? Yeah, 100%. I think everyone <laughs> suffers from that. But um, And the way, in my opinion, to go about it is a product development and, and social media is the way forward. If you, we, we've seen in our social enterprise, which looks at dried fruits, nuts and saffron from Afghanistan, Firstly, we surveyed that you can't compete with the big players like Turkey and Iran. Um, so we didn't go into wholesale, we rather went into high-end and, and, and positioned the brand as a high-end brand, um, looking at the UAE. And the way, what we noticed was that young for the younger people, dried fruits, fresh fruits doesn't appeal to them. So what we did was we made chocolate mixes, we made different kind of mixes. So you have to really work on your product Firstly and secondly, as social, to reach the younger population now, you have to look at social media. If not, then I, I don't, uh, closing that gap, and it's a hard one when you look at crafts and youth, it's, I think social media and product development, a combination with both, um, would help try and draw that gap closer. These are the rules of the game yeah. nowadays. <laughs> if you can't beat them, you've got to join them, haven't you? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, any questions from you? Please, shout it no. out. <laughs> We've got a microphone even. Yes, I love it. Give this lady a round of applause. The bravest lady today in the Folklife studio. <laughs> uh, good evening. This has been a wonderful uh, discussion. And um, uh, as a maker myself, I'm always concerned about the issues of uh, the next generation and also apprenticeships, especially for um, you know, families where the, if the kids don't see people prospering, they may not want to continue. And how do you address uh, apprenticeships? And that's for both That's people. a very good question. Have an answer question. Um, yeah, uh, I think like earlier I mentioned, serving as a platform is also important for the young people, all craftspeople, people from, um, what we say, we're, we're trying to bridge that gap or bring it closer. Apprenticeships is, is, is a great way and helping them step into that. So offering opportunities, serving as a platform, maybe mentorships, apprenticeships, these kind of programs, the week long program you said, family and children, um, things that would appeal to them. So, so apprenticeships is important for them to try to take that first step. The platform has to be there. You have to create that. You have to make them feel comfortable for these young people to get off their iPads. It's a, it's a challenge. So you have to make it something where it would appeal to them, not a a festival, or not, uh, sorry, not, not something tr they would, that they would be like, is, is not for my kind of people. So it's got to be, relate to them. And um, apprenticeships, like you said, is, is a great way. Um, if it's sort of customized and created in ways that the Tashkil does, for example, or other that they are doing in the UAE actively. Um, so yeah, I think pr creating that platform is, is, is key. I think also it's, uh, the parents is a, has a big, big part of this. If, so if they don't grow this thing in them and make them love it and go for it, they will not do it. So the base should be right first. Also, I think in terms of the UAE, there are formal methods of learning, apprenticeships, mm -hmm. men mentorships, and there are the informal. Um, and uh, you know, you've got to remember the UAE is a tribal society where people set, people in a higher status will set an example for others to follow. Um, uh, women like Sara who step out and go independent and set up their own businesses become a role model for others to follow. If she can do it and she's allowed to do it, then I can do it. So that is incredibly important. That has a uh, strong status in the UAE. In terms of formal apprenticeships and mentorships, there are a lot of government institutions across the UAE who are preserving traditional crafts, working with women in rural areas um, and helping them to uh, find commercial outlets um, so that they're products are sold in the malls in the UAE and then the money goes back to them. Um, Sharjah Heritage Institute, we've worked with the ladies there, they're a force to be reckoned with, um, and uh, also al Sugha and al Ghadir in Abu Dhabi, phenomenal social enterprise networks that really cover thousands of square kilometers across al Dhafra, the empty quarter, to unite the women craftsmen um, that are living in the villages there. Yeah. Please, our next question. Well, you wanted some questions. Uh, mine is not so much a question, but a comment, and it's something about, we, um, you know, maybe knowledge transfer. So I 
come from the diplomatic world and then I worked at the Smithsonian with cultural festivals for seven years and then museum fundraising and I was a fundraiser for archaeological sites. And then I thought the best way for me to create a legacy is actually to start my company. So I have a uh, lifestyle brand here in Washington, D.C. and we're right now the largest investor in women craft makers from Latin America. So we invest in 50 and we've been able to actually um, make a lot of the kind of take heritage craft as make, and make them contemporary, but also save like 20 techniques. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Latin America is a very, very important region because it has some of the, like it still has craft traditions from Europe and from, uh, Latin, from the Middle East sometimes and from Asia and from, uh, from Africa that are not um, still living in these areas. But I feel like a lot of people should just go into business and create brands that can actually take these women and these craftsmen and then make them contemporary. And we started in D.C. because it's a very international city and it was the right location instead of going to New York or L.A. But I would love to talk to you guys about. And then one other thing is that we create cultural festivals with collection launches. So we work with embassies to do. We did a collection on Ecuador. We brought a lot of people. So we do these craft with cultural diplomacy. So I would love to talk to you guys afterwards to see how we can, you know, maybe have a transfer of knowledge and exchange with Latin America and then also hear your experiences working with women. I love the idea of the um, documenting these techniques, which is something that we haven't done yet. I think we're losing 50% of our craft traditions in Latin America this century alone. So we're running against time, but it's having to show you know young people it's not your grandmother's craft it's something much more contemporary and we also went in the very luxury like Mar you know it's almost like couture so uh, we have some ideas and we'd love to talk to you guys afterwards right. and if you guys have time to come visit our shop uh, we'd love to have you yeah thank you thank you very thank much you. Thank you. It just sh shows that we are learning the same lessons, we're experiencing the same challenges and opportunities wherever we are in the world when it comes to craft. Any yes. other questions? Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Anything? All right, don't worry. We're going to get off this stage, come down there, and we can have a lovely chat with you. Um, uh, if you would like to purchase any items, the FBMI is over at the marketplace, yeah. Yeah. and uh, Tashkil also has some pro products in the marketplace. Yeah. And Sara, are you in the marketplace? Yes. Smart world, this is amazing. <laughs> so get yourself over to the marketplace next to the National Museum of Asian Art, the Freer Gallery, and you can pick up some really wonderful items at affordable prices uh, from the United Arab Emirates. Um, we're here, the United Arab Emirates is here until the 4th of July, open from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then there's some wonderful concerts uh, after six o'clock every day here. So thank you very much, follow us online. And before I forget, let me say a big thank you to our stage crew here. This wonderful man who is doing the ASL uh, signing with us today. Um, the United Arab Emirates is here thanks to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, the UAE Ministry of Culture. The Under Secretary is walking around, so say hello to him. Um, and of course, it's supported by Etihad Airways. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Two of you, two of them did fantastic.